morning. It is good to see you. Um, I know I'm supposed to say that, but I really mean it. Uh, it's good to be with God's people. Uh, it's been a, uh, an interesting few weeks for my family um, and to just gather with you and uh, sing praises and open his word together and have fellowship together. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, for those of you that are visiting, my name is Bruce Case, uh, just one of the elders here. Uh, it's my privilege to open the Word of God with you this morning. We're going to be in um, Psalm 63. Um, uh, that was announced in our weekly email. If you have, are signed up and you get those, you get those on Friday. Uh, and it would have told you the message is going to be from Psalm 63. And uh, hopefully you got that. And some of you actually then opened your Bibles and read Psalm 63 just in preparation. I see some heads nodding, so that's good. You might have noticed that it sounds a lot like Psalm 42 in certain ways. And that was the last psalm I preached back on whatever it was, the fifth of, uh, of this month. Um, there's a lot of um, language similarities. Uh, both of them talk about thirst for God. It's a common theme. Um, they talk about being away from Jerusalem and the sanctuary or the, the tabernacle. Um, they, uh, they both talk about meditating on God at night. When they lay down, they think about God. Um, and they both talk about the presence of enemies. A lot of overlap, but they're not the same psalm. In 42, there's something going on that, that I labeled spiritual depression. Um, the man trusts God. He loves the Lord. He's looking to the Lord, but the Lord seems a million miles away. He just can't seem to break through. Now, it gets better as the psalm goes on, but, but he's still down in the valley, but he's fighting, and it's a good psalm. In 63, the same language, there's thirst there, there's desire, there's hunger, there's all that, there's problems, but he's not in the valley. I won't argue that he's on the mountaintop either. He's kind of where most of us live, probably about halfway up. He's been in better places, he's been in worse places, but he's overall in a good place. Uh, so there's similarities, there are differences. We will note some of that as we work our way through the psalm. By the way, if you do not have a Bible, would be thrilled to give you one, raise your hand, and somebody will pass one out to you. This looks like pretty much the usual crowd, and my guess is you all have a Bible, so that's good. Okay, before we begin, let me pray. Father God, we really do thank you for the opportunity to gather. Uh, we share one another's joys. We share one another's burdens. Uh, we share one another's lives. And if that's not true for somebody in here, I pray that they would work to make it true because there are dear saints in this room that are faithful prayer warriors, that are compassionate listeners, that have wisdom. Um, Lord, let, let us draw together as a body and make use of the fact um, that, that you've given us one another. We can talk to one another and pray to one another and confess sins to one another and share hopes with one another. And now, Lord, as we turn to this psalm, I am well aware that the background in this psalm applies to more than one family in this room. Um, there are hard things behind a very good psalm. And so I pray that there will be hope and healing and humility and rejoicing and community that comes out of our time together this morning. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, some psalms have what we call a superscription. It's a line above the top that usually tells us uh, who the author is and maybe some other details that will give us some context. Psalm 63 has a superscription, and it goes like this. It says, A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, uh, David wrote a lot of psalms, so that, that's great. We know David. But why is he in the wilderness of Judah? That actually tells us something very important. Scripture tells us he was out there twice, both times because somebody was trying to kill him. He fled to the wilderness of Judah when Saul, becoming jealous and enraged, uh, wanted to kill him. And then he was out there a second time when Absalom, his son, his son, wanted to kill him and take the crown. Now, of those two times, I'm almost sure that it's the second one. It's his son. And I say that because in verse 11 of this psalm, David refers to himself as king. He wasn't king 
when Saul was around. He was anointed back in 1 Samuel 16. Saul is still king, still alive. And uh, God sends Samuel to Jesse and says, I'm going to pick another king from the sons of Jesse. And so Jesse puts the, the most probable candidates out there. And at each point, uh, Samuel says, no, it's not him. It's not him. It's not him. And they said, do you have another one? And he said, well, I got one. He's kind of young. And he's out tending the sheep. And Samuel says, bring him. And he brings him. And the Lord says, that's the one. And so Samuel anoints David way back in, I think it's 1 Samuel 16. But David doesn't take the title king. He doesn't take the role king. That was a private moment with just the family there. At the end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. It ends with his death. You start into 2 Samuel. Things happen in 2 Samuel, among other things, the reuniting of the kingdom. They'd already split a little bit. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom weren't really getting along. Well, they're reunited under David. And then you finally get to 2 Samuel 3.13, I believe it is, or 3.23, where it finally calls David king. The point of that is he's not king while Saul is alive. Which means, because he's king in this psalm, Saul's dead, and the only other person that chased David out into the wilderness was his own son, Absalom. This song is written by a man whose son wanted him dead. You talk about broken family dynamics. It's here. To be able to worship in this context, to sit down and write a song and lead God's people in worship is remarkable, to say the least. And this is a psalm... That, this is where you expect a lament. There's different categories of songs, and lament is one of the largest categories where you just go before God and you go, why, why, why are things the way they are? Please fix them. That's a song of lament. Psalm 63 is not a song of lament. It's a song of worship. It's got a clearly defined structure. It's got three stanzas. Uh, the first one consists of four verses, the second three verses, and then we finish with another four-verse stanza at the end. They're easy to spot, easy to identify, because each one begins the same way. They begin with a statement about the psalmist's soul. My soul thirsts for you, verse 1. My soul will be satisfied, verse 5. My soul clings to you, verse 8. That's the outline. Very easy to follow. It's the outline the author gives us as he writes a three stanza worship hymn, and it's the one that we're going to follow today. So let's read stanza one, verses one through four. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Oh God, you are my God. What a great way to begin a psalm. And in fact, I will argue it's the theme of this song. This is, this is David in a difficult situation saying, God, you are my God. But what does that even mean? It's interesting, too. It's, it's Elohim. It's kind of the generic name for God. Well, here's what I think it means. God, it, he's, he's addressing the God of the heavens. You are my God. I think points us towards the fact that we have different ways of defining God. Some of you find a God in money, pleasure, relationship, power, identity, reputation, health, achievement, fame, whatever it is. In that sense, a God is what satisfies your soul. It's what makes you feel good. It, it, it what, it's what fills you up inside. And there's a lot of false gods out there, and you know it. The advertising industry is inviting you into a false god every time you watch their ad. 
it's an old ad, I'm, I'm dating myself, but haven't you really done without a Buick long enough? If only you had a Buick and the right cologne and the right polo shirt and the right shoes, you would be happy. Oh God, that's my God. David says, no, oh God, you are my God, which means, I believe, and we're going to see this confirmed in the psalm, you're where I find pleasure. You're where I find satisfaction. You're where I find safety. We see this unfold. As the psalmist tells us, he earnestly seeks God because he's thirsty. You can tell a lot about who your God is when your soul, because remember this is soul, my soul thirsts. Find out a lot about who your God is when you have a thirsty soul. You turn on the TV. Do you go shopping? What do you do? Where do you find satisfaction? Where do you find relief from that spiritual thirst? Is it in the video game? Where is it? Who is your God? Well, David says that God is so refreshing, so necessary. He is so much the one that satisfies this spiritual thirst that he has that he says, when I don't find you, I get faint. He says, my flesh faints for you. I either find you, experience you, drink deeply of God, or I faint. Oh God, you are my God, because you are the one who satisfies my thirst. We all get thirsty. Whether you're a Christian or not yet a Christian, you're thirsty. God made you that way. Augustine has a very famous prayer. He said, God, let me find no rest until I find my rest in you. Don't let me satisfy my thirst until I satisfy it in God. God made you thirsty with the hope, the design that you would seek and find where the water really comes from. Jeremiah 2 is very helpful in understanding this. Um, in Jeremiah 2, the people have chosen to rebel against God. Uh, but listen to how the, the rebellion is described. He says, Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. You hear it? They're thirsty, but they didn't go to the fountain of living waters. What did they do? They hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's not a word we use much. A cistern is basically a hole in the ground that you dig and you line with clay or, or brick or whatever it is, so it holds water. God says, I'm living water, and I'll give you all you want. And they said, no, thanks, we'll dig a hole for ourselves. That's sin. The sin is not in thirst. The sin is where you go to satisfy your thirst. God has created you with both a physical thirst and a spiritual thirst, and I'm going to suggest strongly that the first one exists to give you a picture of the latter so you know what's really going on in your own soul. And you either satisfy the former one, your physical thirst, or you die. It doesn't take long. You don't have water. And you either satisfy the second one with God or you die. And the second death is far worse than the first. I'm convinced that thirst is a reality that God has woven just into our existence. So we might have a picture, an illustration of just how much we need him. The, the, the depression of Psalm 42 is grounded in the fact that the man is thirsty and he can't find God. He knows he's there, hope builds throughout the psalm, but there's a distance. Psalm 63, thirst is used in, in a, a slightly different way. He still needs God. He still wants God. But his experience of God is recent enough and fresh enough that he's not parched. You know he will be. If he doesn't find God, if he doesn't drink deeply from God, eventually he will become faint but he's actually in a much better place than the psalmist is in Psalm 42. He says in verse 3, 
I think what is maybe perhaps the key verse uh, in helping us understand this psalm. It says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Your steadfast love, God, is better than life. What's life? Is it your marriage? Family? Job? Friends? Church? What's your life? Is it your good health? Hope it's not your 401k that's taken a beating in the last month or two. But all those things can be good. And many times you kind of collect and say, how's life going? And, and we answer in accordance with how those things are. How's the family? How's the health? How's, how's the job? How's your life? None of those are bad. When, when he says... The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. He's saying you can take away all those things. Just give me the Lord. It's not that he wants to lose them. It's not that he doesn't value them. It's not that he's not appreciative. But they're not his God. They're not his comfort. They do not satisfy his thirst in the same way that God does. It might be good today if you sat down and you just asked yourself, what is life to me? Somebody said, how's, how's life going? What will it be focused on? Will it be focused on the good gifts that God gives us? Or will it be focused on the giver of those good gifts? The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. My family's been here 12 years now. In that 12 years, we've seen a lot of saints come walking through that door. Uh, thirsty for God. Hungry for God. Satisfied in God. And we've seen a lot of them carried out, wheeled out in a coffin. I've had a lot of funerals here. They are more alive today than they were ever walking through that door. They have discovered, and it took dying to do it, the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Don't necessarily, and I said they, they, they had to die to do it. That's probably not true. But dying does put an emphasis and an exclamation point on it, doesn't it? We can say it all we want. The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life, but it's when you are facing death that you discover is it true we have people right now that are facing that question and they're doing really well and saying the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life I selected this psalm with a hope that this morning would help you to say that because whether you're in the wilderness like David is whether you're on your deathbed as some are um if God has been the one that you turn to to satisfy the thirst of your soul, you will find that you can say it and that you, in fact, mean it. It's not merely the testimony of the psalmist, it's also the testimony of the Apostle Paul. He wrote in Philippians 121, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What in the world does that mean? To live as Christ, for Paul, is fruitful ministry. Sharing the gospel, planting churches, writing letters to churches that we have that we can look at 2,000 years later to stay anchored in the faith. To live as Christ is fruitful, joyful, eternally rewarded labor for Christ. And that's good. And to die is gain. You know why? Because that's when you see him face to face. That's when the mirror is no longer in front of you, that dark mirror that we only get to see a little bit through. You get to see him face to face, and Paul says, when I get to see him face to face, that's gain. They can kill me, they can take my life, they can make it miserable, but while I live, I'll live for Christ. And when I die, I get him. And that is gain. That's his way of saying 
The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Some of you might remember a few months back, I, I shared a quote um, from Joseph San. Joseph was a Romanian pastor uh, at the time when Romania was part of the Soviet Union, so communism was the government uh, and the rule of the land. Um, he wouldn't stop preaching. And that upsets a government determined to stamp out faith, to stamp out Christianity. And so they arrested him at various occasions, they threatened him at various occasions, and they finally got to the point where, okay, if you don't stop preaching, we're going to put a bullet in you. We're going to kill you. And you remember what he said? You cannot threaten me with glory. You put a bullet in me, I get to go see Jesus. To die is gain. You get to see him. You get more of him. And that is vastly more to be desired than even the best that this life can offer. Countless people have died with that as their testimony. Um, J. Gresham Machen will only be a name that's recognized by a few eggheads in the room. Um, he was a theologian in the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, actually, the, the shorter version, I believe, is conservative orthodox. And uh, he was doing some speaking, and he ended up falling ill and uh, spending his last days in a hospital uh, far from home, but a friend was with him. It was very clear he was dying. And in those last moments, his friend asked him, he, he, Machen was quiet, his friend asked him, what are you thinking about? He says, I'm not thinking. I'm enjoying it. It's good. Stanza two. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. So he had thirst as the illustration in stanza one. Now you have food as the illustration in stanza two. I will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And I understand fat and rich food doesn't translate very well into our culture, does it? We want the low-cal version. We need the low-cal version. But in a culture where if you were going to go somewhere, you walked. You know, I, I've got a Fitbit that I haven't worn in a while. And, uh, and I used to celebrate, hey, I got 10,000 steps in today. That was an average morning, probably, for a person in their context. So they needed that calorie-laden food. So just read that and understand that is that was just symbolic for us for the best possible meal you could have. And the psalmist is saying, you know that meal that you really enjoy, that you're really hungry for, the best meal you've ever had. My soul thirsts for God because that's what I experience when I find God. It's, it's better than the best water. It's better than the best meal. It was David who wrote Psalm 34, 8 and said, taste and see that the Lord is good. David has tasted often and his testimony is that the Lord is good. Last night, I'm putting the final edits on uh, the sermon, and I'm working at this verse. My soul will be satisfied as with a rich and fat meal. My phone dings. It's a text from Jonathan Naranjo. Some of you know him. He and his wife, Aniana, their family moved to Ocala area a year or two ago. Um, but it dinged. There were no words. A picture just popped up. We can put the, there's the picture. My soul will be satisfied as with rich and fat food. And tell me I wasn't hungry. And tell me that wasn't helpful and of God to say, let's take that physical hunger that we so enjoy satisfying with something like that on the grill with friends and say, God's better. God's more satisfying. I, I just took that as a kindness of God. It just at the right moment, that picture. And by the way, he said, I didn't mean to send it to you. <laughs> and I said, well, somebody else did. 
So that was good, and that was encouraging. If you want some idea, because what the psalmist is trying to do is to say, look, folks, God is satisfying. He's more satisfying than any other experience you can have in this life. If you want an idea of just how, how far he's trying to push that, think how Scripture talks about God. You've seen the poster with the names of God? How many names do you have? You know, I, I, some of us have three, and I know some of us have five or six. But there's roughly 72 recognized names of God. Why? Because one name doesn't cut it. Ten names doesn't cut it. Fifty names doesn't cut it to explain all that he is. You, you, you've seen the poster, and then you, you've, you've seen all the different ways where it just people are surprised as God describes himself in a certain way. He says, the Lord, Moses wants to know how in the world God can forgive the people after the golden calf. And God appears to him. He says, I want you to see. What does he say? The Lord, the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He describes himself. He says, this is what I'm like. He, he gives us word pictures. He says, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, one of my favorite illustrations um, of, of God kind of being anthropomorphic, giving us a, a man type of picture, but he's the one acting, is from Deuteronomy 1, where he says, you saw how in the wilderness I carried you like a man carries his son. And it just goes on and on and on. We will run out of language before we run out of glory. You've, you've just come to the end where you've said all you need to say, all you can say, and you haven't begun to exhaust the goodness and the glory and the satisfaction that is the Lord our God. We should note that the psalmist uses a future tense. He says, my soul will be satisfied, not my soul is. So there, there is a place where he's not depressed, he's not in the valley, things are not falling apart, but he's also not where he would like to be. But he explains how he goes from one to the other. My soul will be satisfied, my thirst will be satisfied. And he begins to tell us how he does it in verse 6. I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. I will sing. He's confident. He's determined. And those memories of God, it, it doesn't just appear from nowhere. He doesn't wish himself into a better place. Bed's a good place in that turn off the TV. Kids are asleep, I hope if they're still in the house. <clears throat> and you lay down in your bed and you begin to think about God. His faithfulness, his word, his goodness, his promises. And the psalmist says, when I do that, I know it's going to happen. I will sing for joy. He knows how to go from being thirsty to being satisfied, from being hungry to being satisfied, from being just kind of in an okay place to having a song. And it's to put God before him. God is honored both by people who are in the valley and saying, I don't know where you are, but I want you. God is honored by those who are on the mountaintop saying, I don't want anything but you, you are so good. And God is honored by everybody in between that looks not to that broken cistern they dug, but to the fountain of living waters. Third stanza, verse 8. <clears throat> My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. So he thirsts in stanza one. His soul has hunger in stanza two, and now his soul clings to God in stanza three. And cling is an interesting term, isn't it? 
We use it often if somebody's in danger. If they're drowning, they will cling to a life preserver. Got a child who's scared of the thunder or some other event, they cling to their parent. If a person doesn't want to die, we say they're clinging to life. But it's not always a term that's associated with danger. It can be, and it should be. It's, it's good. It's also associated with deep affection. First use of the word cling, the Hebrew word behind that, <clears throat> is in Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's a, that's a clinging of intimacy and joy. In Ruth, there's an amazing use of it. You, you know very quickly the background story that Naomi, your husband and sons, all went to Moab to escape the famine. The sons get married. And then the husband and the, these two sons, who are now married to, to Moabite women, they all die. So you get three widows. Food comes back to Bethlehem. They hear about it. They start journeying back. And then the light comes on for Naomi. And she says, there's no life for you back there. I'm not going to produce more sons. I'm too old for that. And if I did, you wouldn't wait for them. And so you need to turn around and just go back, be with your own people, make whatever life you can in Moab. And one of the daughters-in-law, Orpha, listens to her. And it says she kisses her and she turns back. But then we read this. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. If you know the story, it's just one of the most beautiful stories of devotion, loyalty, hope, faith. She clung to her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law is going back to Bethlehem, where God is in her mind, and she's right. It, it's so, oh, I won't go down that road. The, the, the book of Ruth is just so amazing. Was, was anybody ever more wrong than Naomi? There's nothing there for you. Yeah, there was. There was a Boaz. Those two verses talk about a clinging that's not born out of fear, but of affection and delight. There's a, a third illustration. The last one I'll give you on this. <clears throat> it has elements of both. It's from Jeremiah 13. Uh, God had told Jeremiah, uh, go get a waistband, brand new one. The waistband is um, a, a glorified belt goes around, holds everything together when you're wearing your, your robe. And he said, dig a hole, bury it in the hole. A little while later, he says, okay, go, go dig it up. And he digs it up, and it's what you'd expect. It's all ruined. Moisture has ruined it. Critters have ruined it. Bugs have ruined it, etc. And uh, God had said, that's, that's kind of like what Israel is like. And here's, here's the verse, verse. Chapter 13, verse 11 of Jeremiah. For as the waistband clings to the waist of a man... So I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But they did not listen. You were made to cling to God. You were made to experience him as your father, your husband, your protector, your provider, your joy the one who satisfies your thirst, the one who satisfies your hunger, the one who is just there for you in a way that no one and nothing else can be. God did that because when people treat him that way, with that honor, it gives him glory. He says, I did this so that you might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. That's who God made them to be. It's who he made us to be that we might cling to him that neither Israel nor Judah was willing to do so, but the psalmist is. He says, my soul clings to you. You satisfy me like nothing else satisfies me. Nothing's going to separate me from you. All of this just sustains David throughout the troubles he's facing, and he is facing troubles. Verse 9 tells us that there's people looking to destroy his life. They want to kill him. Verse 11 tells us that the people that are hunting him are liars. And to make the pain about as bad as it can be, it's his son that's behind all of it. It's 
a really good song. Oh God, you are my God. The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. I thirst for God. My soul hungers for God. I find safety in God. I, I hide under the shadow of his wings. It's such a good psalm that it's hard to get your head around the fact that this is the context behind it. My son wants to kill me. Somebody get me pen and paper. I need to write a song. Really? Really? How can he do that? Why would he do that? Makes you think, doesn't it? We might ask, well, is, is your faith strong enough to do that? To declare that he's my God, no matter what my family situation is, my work situation, my health situation, he's my God. But I don't want to make David the hero here. King David's not the one we're to admire. Because King David is not the one who satisfies his own soul. And he's not the one that's going to satisfy your soul. King Jesus is. There is a God who satisfies your soul so deeply, so thoroughly. Who satisfies your hunger so deeply and thoroughly. Who invites you to take shelter under his wings at all times. That God is so real to David that they can tell him your son wants to kill you and he can say I'm going to write a song David in doing that gives evidence that he actually believed and he actually experienced what it was that he claimed to know the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life my son wants to kill me I've got God, and that's better. Oh God, you are my God is no small thing to say in that context. But it's a good thing to say, and it's a true thing to say. We need to know him better, don't we? I mean, there's a sense in which you read this, and you, and you see the, the context, and you see the, not just broken family dynamics, but violent, evil, wicked family dynamic. And you say, I'm not going to worship if that happens to me. I'm going to go crawl in a hole somewhere. And David worshiped. And I want to tell you, we've got some work to do to so elevate the goodness and the glory of God in our experience of that, that the worst pain that can come into your life is swallowed up by the greatest glory that's come into your life. Our time in the wilderness is going to come. It will. Your opportunity to worship through pain is going to come. David tells us it can be done. It should be done, and it must be done. His worship is so real. The pain behind it is so incredibly intense and personal. And the only way to put that together with the psalm of worship is to say the comfort God gives and the thirst that he satisfies and the hunger that he satisfies makes all the other things small. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 14. I'll, I'll, 2 Corinthians 4, I'm sorry. I'll end with this. Light, momentary affliction is producing in us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. While we look not to the things that are seen, to a son who wants me dead but to things that are unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. The Bible speaks with one voice on this. And it's telling us the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life so that when you open up a psalm while you're hiding from the one who wants to kill you, your first words out of your mouth are, Oh God, you are my God. Let's pray. Father, it is my deepest heart's desire that that's what you're going to do, what you are doing, what you have been doing in all of our hearts. We are inclined to worship lesser things. We are inclined to turn to more natural comforts. 
that the word comes that you have a child who wants to kill you or some other great family or personal distress. Not our nature to say, I need to worship. Make it our nature. Do not let us be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we see what David saw. We need it. It will not happen apart from your Holy Spirit. And so we call upon him now to take what was purchased by the blood of Christ and apply it to our minds and our hearts and our lives that we might sing and worship in agreement with King David. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.